Talbot in just a moment, just Brian's got signing books. <laughs> so he's a bit busy okay, doing, you, doing drawings. You but can probably start and, start, and they'll we? jump off or yeah. jump in when they come. Yeah, exactly. Roger, they'll join us in a bit. I'm just going to use this bit at the beginning here. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I have a little bit of a presentation ready, but I also wanted to bring in some of the other British guests who are here. As you know, um, Great Britain is a guest country at this year's festival, which is fantastic because we're also celebrating the centenary of Finnish comics this year, 100 years of Finnish comics. Um, and we have several guests here from the UK, uh, including the special guest artist uh, Warren Police here, uh, and also Brian Mary Talbot, who will join us, as I say, in a moment. We also have uh, the self-publisher, self David Kerr, who is here from Glasgow, and has brought a whole bunch of exciting Scottish comics to Finland for the first time, I think. And I'm also very pleased to have to welcome here Sam Arthur, who is part of the, uh, the publisher No Brow, uh, who've been uh, making quite a, a, a noise, quite a splash in British comics, in, particularly in London, over the last year or two. And he's here with the, with the No Brow line of books at the far end of this hall. Um, and I'm Paul Gravett, and I've been sort of really a kind of unofficial ambassador for British comics for some time now, trying to get sort of get them discovered, uh, particularly I suppose in Europe. Um, in fact, back in 1990, um, I curated uh, the first really big exhibition on British comics at the Angoulême Comics Festival in France. Angoulême, as you may have heard, Angoulême in France is the biggest comics festival in the world. I know you went to it, didn't you? I have a microphone. You went to it um, for the first time this year, didn't you, Sam, I think? Yeah, is that yeah, right? it, was, yeah. it was amazing. And you had the most amazing time, was it, with a no-brow table that yeah, it was in the kept wrong, selling out? It was in the wrong tent. Uh, we were in completely the wrong place, everyone kept telling us. Um, and uh, we still managed to sell out all of our books twice. Twice? Yeah, I had yeah. to get one of my colleagues to come from London, especially with an extra suitcase full of books on the second day. So yeah, it was great, it was good. Although it was a really, really inspiring festival. And back in 1990, uh, they opened the, the new comics centre, the Centre National de la Bande de l'Image, or the CNBDI, uh, opened by Jacques Lang, who you might call the very famous French culture minister, Jacques Lang, who was very keen on comics. And I created an exhibition called God Save the Comics. God Save the Comics. Um, which, of course, is, was understood in English in France because they know God Save the Queen, not just because of the, the song and the Queen, but because, of course, of Blake and Mortimer. Blake and Mortimer the British detective character who's always saying bravo and, and, uh, and God save the Queen. And it was an amazing exhibition, fantastic to work on it, um, and a very important step for British comics to get exported and exposed to uh, the European market. I think you could say it was definitely a, a clash of cultures, uh, a sort of, uh, yes, <laughs> it was a bit, of a, a bit of a culture shock for both the British and the French. The French hadn't really been prepared for the um, slightly crazy, anarchic um, comic artists that come out of the UK, where, of course, whereas in France, as you know, it's the ninth art and it's fairly you know, respectable and arty and sophisticated. Really not what British comics were very much at that time anyway. Um, we're now, we're much better guests, I think, at other at festivals now. Um, so this year we have, we have this focus. I thought I'd, what I'd do, I, 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 this is my website, and I'm just gonna have to go forward, hopefully, from this, there we are. That's just a very nice little graphic by a British artist called Bill Bragg. Um, so I think it's just a beautiful little comic. If you get the power of it, it's just very simple. It just shows uh, an idea forming. Hopefully I'm seeing ideas, these light bulbs all over your heads as you gradually sort of rouse yourself. Um, it's one of those energy saving light bulbs that takes its time to warm up, but does actually eventually get to you. Um, these are some of the books that I've done. In fact, the first two were published uh, here by Ottava in Finnish in 2005-2006. And this is the new book I'm just promoting shamelessly here at the festival. It's not out of fact till next month, uh, but it's an extraordinary book. Considering it, I was talking to my friend here, Matthias, Matthias Weibel here, who's contributed. It came together in about sort of six months. It had to, we had no time, but I managed to pull together about 70 contributors from around the world, uh, including Harry Rompati here from fin in Finland, Matthias from Denmark, to put together a really as, well, pretty uh, international uh, um, selection of what I think and what we all kind of eventually agreed were a, a really fantastic list of the best comics to, 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 to read. 
Um, and it's a landmark book, I think, in many ways, not just because I edited it and written a few entries, because it, it actually does put into English, and hopefully also into other languages, it's going to be published in French, Japanese, maybe Finnish, I don't know. Um, you know, a really an attempt to show an overview of the best of comics over the last century or more from many, many countries, including the previous speaker, Franco Doy, who, was, uh, who is in fact included in the book as one of the African entries. Because I think one of, the, one of the big problems we have with comics is we kind of know just our little bits. You've probably all got favorite, maybe favorite Finnish comics or favorite American newspaper strips, or you like Tintin, or you like Batman, or you like Grant Morrison, or whoever it might be. But it's only a tiny bit, really, of how incredibly vast and fascinating comics are. Um, and I'm afraid I'm a bit obsessed about how we should be really hopefully discovering more. There's more than you can ever imagine in comics. It's an extremely rich medium, as rich as film or theatre or literature. So, um, and unfortunately it's not all in English, of course, but more and more of it is. And that's also very really encouraging. So, um, this is a kind of a snapshot. I'm going to bring these guys in. And Mary maybe will join us too, if she wants to. Actually, she'd like to. But anyway, she's very much welcome if she wants to come. Oh, she's there. Well, come up in here. Come up and sit next to Brian. We have, so, just to introduce who we have here as well, we have Sam Arthur, Brian Talbot, and now Mary Talbot have joined us, Warren Police, and David Kerr. So, a round of applause to welcome our panel. Uh, okay. Um, I should also just briefly mention that I uh, direct with uh, Peter Stanbury and Megan Donnelly, who are with, with me today, um, with us here at the festival. Uh, the Comica Festival in London. It's been um, since 2003, and we've had a very exciting guest list over the years. Everyone from Art Spiegelman, Marjan Satrapi, Chris Ware, um, other big names like that, to a lot of the best British artists and creators too, including Brian Talbot, of course. And this year we're working closely with No Brown, uh, who have very kindly been help, help, helping us develop the festival, uh, and we're doing a lot of events also in East London, in the Shoreditch area where No Brown has its gallery and, and related premises. Uh, that's coming up in November, so do come to London for that if you can. Um, and that's some of our other exhibition uh, posters from, from Comica from the past. And that was another event we did just recently. And this is one with Chris Ware and Dan Clowes when they were over here last year, in, just over in London. That's our Comics Fair, which we hold at Bassey Park. And that's one of our other exhibitions we did at the ICS. Yeah, some, some comic stuff there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what have we got up here? Okay. But yeah, that's also a project we did with um, the Asia Europe Foundation, where we brought together artists from seven countries in Europe and seven in Asia and teamed them up to collaborate on projects together. So it's always a very international approach. This was a, 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 another comics project, um, Comica, dealing with corruption in many countries, from Serbia to South Africa to China in comics form. That's one of the examples of that. That's one from David King. And this was the launch party for it, the Comica, two years ago, with the contributors, some of the contributors. That was the show we did last year at the Comica Festival. That's novel, which again was a very innovative exhibition, showing comics on and off the page, going into three dimensions and experimental forms. This is a comic by John Myers, Story of Babel. And here's a comic in three dimensions by Carrie Franzman. Uh, there are, in fact, in the, just a brief kind of overview of what the scene is like in the UK, just so you understand that you know, there's a lot happening you may not even be aware of. In Britain, we've got a lot of different kinds of uh, festivals and conventions happening all across the country. Um, the big, big ones are things like MCM Expo. Have you ever been to MCM Expo, Brian? You've done one of those? Let me switch it on here. There we go. Yeah, I went to, I went to one of them. They're, they're, they're like a, they're, they're in an aircraft hangar, aren't they? Yeah, really? yeah. It's I mean, a media con, it's, it's huge. And I'm well, not the, too the, C, the C in MCM is meant to stand for comics. Right. But you wouldn't know it, really. No, because yeah. there's yeah. like a comics ghetto in there. Yeah. You know, it's like it's one part of it. Yeah, a little back, back quarter of yeah. it in the village. And it is mainly about gaming and, and cosplay in a very big way, yeah. of course. And, and movies. That. And movies, particularly the media. So that's the, the bigger scale one. This year we had a new festival launched by Mark Miller, who of course is a very big name comics writer called Kapow. His title should tell you it was sort of you know, fairly superhero-y and action and genre based. But it was surprisingly successful. I, I had a chance to go to it and I had my, my doubts about it. But in fact what was exciting is it brought in a lot of public who maybe had only just picked up on comics through movies like Green Lantern or 
Thor, for example, and then discovered that actually, oh, there's all these other comics. To give you an idea of one moment that absolutely made me so pleased was there was a, a teenage girl there who was into TV shows like True Blood, and she picked up the True Blood comic, and then on the same distributor's stand, she found a copy of Jim Woodring's Frank, and she was hypnotized by it. Uh, it is a very hypnotic comic, and she'd never seen a comic without words in it. She couldn't, she couldn't, under, she, and she bought it, and she was absolutely amazed. So that's an example of how we all have to have our moments where maybe you get to comics through other media, and then from there discover their, their variety and their real richness. And that, that, that would be my, my first question, perhaps, just to kind of fire at you. What, what was the, um, what, the, what would brought you into comics? Perhaps tell me about it. What, what got you into comics in the first place? Uh, was it And was that the albums, or was it the, te the animation? Uh, no, it was the albums. I had, okay. I had uh, my mum grew up in Belgium, and she had lots of, uh, French versions of, of Tintin, so I grew up reading Tintin in French and not understanding it at all, but it was still amazing to me, and then I got the English versions and then you, you couldn't drag me away, and then Asterix. And, oh, so pretty much the European yeah, comics thing. Yeah. yeah, and there were obviously comics in the UK were like the Beemo and Dandy, and I, 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 you know, I kind of read them, I didn't like them as much, but Tintin was for me, that was it, yeah. Did you get to comics directly, or did something else have to introduce you to them? Before I went to school, my, my parents used to buy me the, um, a nursery comic called Jack and Jill, before I could read. So I just used to look at the pictures, and I've been, I mean, every Christmas my dad bought me a copy of the Rupert the Bear Angle, which is probably the nearest equivalent of the Tantai Uh And so I've, I've always been there, comics, and then the Bean on the Dan, the all those children's humour comics, I grew up with those. And for you? For me, um, well, comic guides came across me to enjoy the cable of the Reno, but uh, I could not at home and didn't find them at all. Of course, your dad wouldn't really have approved of um, comics at all. So you read them at school, I guess? Uh, the teachers, they weren't approved of. Oh. And, uh, amazing. So the only comics I read in the home were the Eagle. Well, the Eagle, the Eagle was, published, the was, was respected because at least it had a, you know, a, a vicar, you know, it had a priest sort of behind it. Comfortable middle classness about it. Yes. It was respectable and it was produced and by educational, a vicar. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or a vicar, produced by a vicar. Reverend Marcus Morris, yeah. Could yeah. you explain, I mean, in Britain you have definitely got this divide between the kind of just anarchic humour and, and enjoyment, something like the Beano and the Dandy, which are still running today and are selling, I mean, they're still selling quite well, I think. And whereas the Eagle, when it began in 1950, was very much a, uh, deliberately anti-entertainment in a sense. It was really meant to be more educational and inspirational. It was even driven by a, a, a Christian Mexican zeal yeah, to, to, get a, to save children, really, to inspire yeah. them. It was very much based on that. Yeah. How about for you, Warren? I mean, you, were comics something you just naturally gravitated to? Or? Um, as a kid, it was comics um, in Britain called Tiger. Um, Oh, that's really enjoy the Rovers. Enjoy the Rovers, Wizard and Chips, um, and then kind of war comics like uh, Warlord and Battle and things oh, like that. Okay. And then eventually 2000 AD, um, but before that, you know, the kind of PDs, stuff like Wizard and Chips. And, uh, yeah. 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 How about you, Jay? What was your first sort of step into comics as a, as a when you were growing up? Um, but did you not grow up with them? Well, I think I kind of. Um, when I was young, I guess I used to look at like Asterix. Um, oh, yeah. I didn't really do that. I just kind of looked at the pictures and then put it away. Something. But um, when I was older, I guess it kind of came and sort of my interest in comics kind of came back and sort of studied illustration and then started reading people like, I guess, the Anke Beutelberger. Anke Beutelberger, yeah, from Germany. So I got quite interested in like, European comics, but then I also liked people like Baxter and oh, yeah. I, I mean I remember reading the Fall and Hell and like the very size of the comics as well. And, 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 it's just, I just, just briefly just not to talk about me all the time, but most of the time. Um, sorry, but just to say that I actually am starting to think that I might not have got into comics. There might there's another there's another one of those kind of alternative moments in those worlds where there's another another or all of us who were not aware, where I didn't actually get into comics because I realised what really got me into comics was, was not comics. I didn't find comics except through their other forms. So for example, in the sixties, um, my first, probably my first comic was uh, TV21, 
where you used to be able to get each week new stories of Thunderbirds, as in five, do you remember? Wonderful. Five. <laughs> yes. Uh, and Stingray and Captain Star, those things my brother and I, my brother and I, were completely fixated with. But of course, that's TV. And then we just discovered that there was a comic that took off that could give you color stories of your favorite TV shows. Um, and you would read them in between the, the, the episodes on television. And then Hergé, I did get into Tintin, I didn't know about Tintin except for the rather creaky animated versions on TV. We had Hergé's Adventures of Tintin, which was great fun. And similarly, um, Batman, superhero comics, I didn't know about them except for na 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 And I wouldn't have discovered that probably if it hadn't been for TV. So I'm starting to realize you all got more or less get into comics without having to go through something else to get to them. But I didn't. I might very well not have gone through them without having those media crossover things. Which made me realize why Kapow, playing that, is a way to get out to an audience that maybe is just stepping into comics through what they know already, through the things they love on the big or small screen. Okay. Um, have I gone backwards here? Okay, that's Kapow. Right, uh, I'll move on more quickly. There are also art festivals going on all over the country, all over the UK. There's one, the, very, the longest running one is the Small Press Comics Festival in Oxford called Caption, um, which is very small. I mean, it's really small. It's like being in somebody's front room, but it's wonderful, very, very friendly festival. And there are ones going on in Birmingham, Bristol, new ones happening in Exeter, Cardiff. They're every, almost everywhere things are happening in, in the comic scene. Comics are also breaking out into the literature world. Where in the last few years, there have been uh, presentations about comics at the London Book Fair, which is the, the Frankfurt Book Fair of the UK. And that's an important step too. Uh, and not just there, Edinburgh Book Festival has had um, comic guests. Have you been to that one? Been to Edinburgh? Yeah. 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 I mean, this is Edinburgh Festival. It's fantastic they're doing that. Um, and so too is a new festival that's uh, coming back again this October in London. Uh, it's an, a, a South East, South Asian literature festival focusing on, particularly on, on India. Um, they, of course, have their own comics traditions, and they've had a, a, a component of graphic novels all, uh, in every, every venue. As we mentioned this morning at the press conference, one of the big changes in the UK, um, no doubt happening here in Finland as well, is that the media and literary worlds are opening up to comics. They are prepared to, to consider them and to debate with them and, 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 and promote them. Um, of course, we have spin-off films. We, not every film has to come from a, a superhero, uh, from America anyway. Kick-Ass, even though it is American, if I'm American artist, it is a very much a, a British or the likes, even more specifically, a Scottish creation, as in Martin Villar's creation of Kick-Ass. And of course, Percy Simmons, uh, T Tamara Drew, was adapted into a film with, with great success. Although, of course, I, I don't know what you feel about the, the process of putting comics into movies. Um, but very often, of course, they do miss the mark. Very often they would change the story or mess about or lose some of the fundamental themes of the, of the films. But again, they are, I think, a way of bringing an audience in. What, what do you think of some of the crossovers that have been done you know, from comics to film? Do you have do anything you think are any good <laughs> at the start, British or not? I thought Tamara Drew was pretty good, actually. Really? Good. Two characters in the graphic novels of large elements of tragedy. It is. The girl dies again, but she yeah. doesn't die in the film. You know, it's, yeah. it's more to keep it more on a light comedy level. And you kind of know where you are from the beginning because Stephen Frears used this kind of jaunty, almost sort of Miss Marple y kind of soundtrack. The music's very kind of quirky but not too dark, isn't it? So you know it's not going to get as dark as the original. And this is, I mean, and I imagine many people will hope that they've gone on from the movie to then discover the graphic novel and realize how good it is. Yeah. Yeah. Have there, have there been plans to adapt any of your work into, into films? Yeah, over the years, people have tried. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, art writing. The people have tried to make a movie of that for about eight years. Yeah. Uh, including a, a Hollywood production company, and that didn't get off the ground. I mean, at the moment, um, dark telephone films are going to try to get money behind the Jungle movie. Oh, well. That's not happened. Uh, the, there's been two different attempts to get the BBC to do uh, an adaptation of Bad Rat. Oh. Uh, two different director producer teams Great. been turned down. Mm. All time, so, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's much more difficult to make things happen, I see, than, 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 than not. And I would say it's a classic case where if you've got media crossovers, um, you, know, you, want, you want to move you to that territory, very often it's easier just to go and make the graphic novel and not to wait around to try and develop your movie project or TV project in, in, in the real world. No, I, I never think of it as no. possible movies. No. But in, in, in certain cases, such as Alice in Sunderland, you know, 
no way that I could have made him to a movie. No. Although, funnily enough, uh, somebody's bought the rights to adapt it as a theatrical production. Wow. Uh, no, well, it, was, it is theatrical. It's a small production company, and they're doing the first, very first production now, which is uh, set in, in, uh, in Sunderland. Oh. And, um, it's, it's, it's going to be performing something. It's about minors, yeah, it's called Collier Road. Um, but they're hoping for the big production to do to do ice. Right. And these aren't, well, one of them's Sunderland based, that's a connection, but they you know, the, one of them's uh, uh, Aris, the actor. The Royal Shakespeare Company. Company. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 you know, I don't know, I believe it when I see it. Right, right, hopefully it will. Okay. Um, Oh yeah, the other way that, that people can get started, we should perhaps, we, can, we mentioned this, I think, we're talking with both Warren earlier this afternoon, and, and your first starts in the underground press, and somebody now, Nogra, being in many ways a launch pad for new artists to get, to get printed. That's one of the big challenges, of course, is to where do you start? The small press and self-publishing, as you know, is a major part of getting your work in front of people and building up a following and an identity and a name. But also there are in the UK several competitions just at the moment, in fact Brian, you're going to be one of the judges, aren't you, this year, for the Observer Jonathan Cape uh, Comica Festival Graphic Short Story Prize, which is now in its fifth year and has uncovered an, an absolutely amazing wealth of talent. I can tell you, every time, I've judged it now every, every year, the last five years, this is the fifth time, and it's absolutely overwhelming how much talent is out there which is just need somewhere for them to, to, to be printed and to be, to be exposed. And that's the most encouraging thing we've seen, I think, in the last few years, as I'll show just in a moment here, is the number of, of new outlets in the UK for, for comics publishing, particularly, as we were saying this morning, um, uh, in graphic novel form. This is where comics have changed. They're no longer as important as a periodical format. They're more important in book format. And they're being published by major publishing houses like Faber and Jonathan Cape and others as well as, of course, some more specialised new publishers. I'm going to give you a quick kind of overview here, and then we can get discuss a bit more, but let me see, what have we got here? Oh yeah, to give you an example of the opportunities, that was some competitions. This was a, uh, a talent search to find an artist for a graphic novel aimed at women, not only at women, about the kind of, sort of, sort of sleazy world of party girls, of escorts and this kind of thing, and they found this brilliant artist called Faye Dalton, who really is one of the uh, an amazing discoveries she's already done doing new work. Um, similarly, here we have other. Is that Jonathan Tufo? Sorry. Um, yeah, that's right. Excuse me. I didn't like that. Sorry, just a minute. I'm trying to get this to work. It's good to get this. Okay, excuse me. Right. One of the other important things that's been going on in the UK also has been the rise of women artists. Uh, something that, that again, that uh, Mary Talbot mentioned at the press conference this morning. Um, because this is true again across the world, particularly happening here in Finland. Not everywhere, of course, but in many countries we've seen in the last 10, 20 years or so, the rise of women creators and readers. It's no longer such a boisy environment. And if you look around, this, this very tent, you can see it's probably about 50-50 men and women, which it certainly wasn't the case in the even 10 or 20 years ago. And this is very important because it's meaning that new ideas and voices and subjects are being dealt with, and we're reaching you know, a bigger public, a very large public, because many more women, frankly, uh, read and buy books than blokes like me, like men, don't tend to read as much. Um, that's a very encouraging sign, I think. Um, and this thing I'm showing you here is called Ladies Do Comics, which is just here. There we are, this thing here. This is a really amazing monthly get-together organised by Sarah Lightman and Nicholas Streeton. It's not only for women, not only about women creators, but it's a particularly women-friendly, focused group. And it's a kind of model, I think, for what should be happening ideally in many capital, many cities, wherever they might be, as a way of making something different happen in the comic scene. Um, another, just, just to give you an idea what else happens in the UK, we've had a crossover with the literary world in terms of um, big respect from the Royal Society of Literature, who only uh, a few years ago um, awarded, welcomed into this uh, 
uh, uh, very exclusive ranks, both Posey Simmons, who we mentioned a moment ago, and Raymond Briggs. And this is alongside of some of the biggest novelists in, 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 in history, so that's a major step. And similarly, people like Zadie Smith has, has edited a book of, uh, of graphic novel, uh, of, of short stories, which included work by, uh, by comic artists. And we also have, of course, a wake up call in the world of art. Uh, as you may be aware, here in Helsinki, uh, there's going to be a major exhibition of Finnish comics next March, happening in the Kiasma Art Gallery, uh, put together by Harry Rompati and Gula Hanninen, celebrating 16 of the best contemporary Finnish comic artists. And in the UK last year, the Tate Britain Gallery um, hosted a show called Rue Britannia, which included quite a lot of uh, historical and present day humorous and comic art, and was, a, again, a, 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 an opening that you wouldn't have expected. Um, we also have conferences going on, academic conferences across the country, of a very high standard, from Manchester to, uh, to London and Scotland. Uh, we even have the very first conference in the world just here about graphic medicine, which is a whole subject that hasn't been dealt with before in comics in this way. We also have no less than three academic journals dedicated to comics, um, which is extraordinary for a country that hasn't got many publishers. Uh, there are the three titles there. Um, and in terms of the marketplace, as I mentioned, there, there are, it is less based on periodicals and magazines, but it is still existing and over here, in, uh, sorry, in the UK. We still have the Beano Dandy, which our fans uh, grew up with. We still have 2000 AD, which is very strange, because I don't know about you, I'm living in 2011, and it's very strange that we still have a comic that's meant to be futuristic called 2000 AD. I mean, that just makes no sense. And of course, Judge Dredd has, has his own monthly. And we have Viz, and more recently this year, Clint, as sort of more supposedly adult, or at least adolescent, uh, humor comics, or satirical comics. And we have magazines like Comic Heroes and Neo about comics. But then it's in the graphic novel world that really things have developed. The publisher's made the biggest difference, I think, is Jonathan Cape, isn't it, Brian? And maybe you'd like to say a few words because they're your publisher, and they've really allowed you to, to work full-time on projects that are close to your heart and not have to necessarily always wonder about the next commercial job. Is that fair to say? Um, yes, I suppose so. I mean, we started doing graphic novels well before I joined them. In fact, I offered Alice uh, to them uh, they would already been publishing graphic novels for a couple of years and I offered Alice them before I'd really started and they turned it down and they said we, I don't think they could understand what it was it's a very hard thing to describe to somebody um, but what I did was I carried on four years later I, I took it to them almost finished and they looked at it and said oh yeah this is okay we'll do this and I've been with them since but um, yeah I was there many more than care isn't there there's uh, Matthew and and, and also, well, I'll show you a few more of them here, actually. Yeah. These, these, those three, there are Brian's books. In fact, there's the cover of the, the new book, Doctor of Her Father's Eyes, that uh, Brian and Mary have done together. Um, but they've done many others. Their key authors, really, of course, were Raymond Briggs and, and Percy Simmons. And the success they had, particularly with Ethel and Ernest, and then, of course, subsequently buying in Chris Ware and Clowes and Sacco and Persepolis, by much less atrophy, led to them originating more UK material. That, to me, is the most important thing. It's very easy to kind of cherry pick bestsellers from around the world and just bring them out. But the key thing is to support and encourage I mean, I, I did, UK talent. I didn't actually take, when I uh, was developing the idea for Granville, I did a proposal, you know, to try and sell it to different publishers. I didn't actually show it to Jonathan Cape, even though they published ours. I was sending it to DC Comics. Um, I didn't think it was appropriate for Cape. I, yeah, because they don't, they, they don't do science fiction. And, um, I, anyway, I was having dinner with Dan Franklin, the editor, uh, talk about Alice, uh, whatever. And I said, oh, by the way, I've got a, uh, would you like to propose a science fiction book? Are you, are you totally against science fiction? He said, no, we've just not seen one we'd write. And anyway, he liked the, you know, the sort of anthropomorphic, what, and also the, the, the conceit about this, uh, this is French room in the world and this uh, French-English thing that's going on in the, and he wanted to do it. What's something of some of a departure, I guess, in terms of, you wouldn't have expected it to come from Cape, no, but it has. No, but they did accept it, so it's great. It's quite encouraging, isn't it? Um, other things that they've done, these are the three artists I want to point out to you that you may not have come across who are new and very exciting, because uh, we are here celebrating great British comics now, and that now includes very young talents coming up. Uh, John Broadley, 
and Julian Hanshaw and William Goldsmith all came through essentially that common graphic short story prize competition. They were either winners or finalists and were then allowed and you know, were then commissioned to do full net graphic novels um, from CAPE. And that's an important step, I think. Similarly, CAPE has also commissioned David Hughes, who's a very well known illustrator, not well known in comics, never done comics really before and produced this extraordinary book, uh, Walking the Dog, which I can assure you is in the 1001 book, and is one of the most wildly experimental British graphic novels you've ever seen, and I would recommend very highly, though it's not, it's not a light, easy read, but I mean, come on, you can work at it, you can read, you can look at pictures, and it's a very rewarding, brilliant book. And similarly, they've done interesting things with um, adaptations. This is an artist called Nick Hayes, who's taken the rhyme of the ancient mariner, a very famous Samuel Coleridge ballad, a poem, which you probably know all about the albatross around the neck, etc., and modernized it and turned it into a brilliant uh, environmental fable, particularly critiquing the terrible gyre of plastic that is uh, on our planet, like a horrible kind of boil in the middle of the Pacific, which is there every time you throw away a plastic bag or a bottle of water. So don't add to that gyre if you can. It's a really brilliantly done book, and he's written a completely new poetry. It's not an adaptation, it's an interpretation of the story. Um, Faber, who are another publisher that is respected in the world of literature, have done graphic novels, starting with the work of Andrzej Klamowski, who worked most, most mostly in completely silent, woodcut-style graphics. They've gone on to publish people like Adrian Tomine and now Craig Thompson. We have popular Walker books. Walker is especially good at developing uh, new comics for young people and all ages. Now, the problem here is what you often get, of course, are, are just mentioning media tie-ins. What you tend to get are the slightly lazy approach of we've got a best-selling author, so they turn his book into a graphic novel. And it's kind of lazy, really, isn't it? Um, but they have also originated new stuff. So in this case, Walker, for instance, uh, have done Salem Brownstone, which was an extraordinary production for a a children's or young person's uh, book publisher. It's a very dark, gothic, spooky book, kind of inspired by Audrey Beardsley, and, uh, and it's, it's an amazing, amazing production. And similarly, they also have, have, have developed um, a trilogy now of books by Dave McKean, collaborating with David Almond, who is very well known for writing Skellig, which is a brilliant children's book, and that's The, the Savage, the first of those. Uh, and they have more to come. There's a couple here I can show you. The Sleepwalkers, from Vivian Schwartz. That's going to be one of the best books of next year. I've just seen the whole book, it's incredible. For, ch for children, but for everyone. Absolutely beautiful book. Um, similarly, we also had, unfortunately came to an end, we had the DFC, which was an attempt to set up a weekly comic, a bit like Spiru or Tanta, not like the, like the Vino. It has more serials and more variety of, of, of styles. And though the comic is gone, uh, there were lovely hardback books collected of the stories. Here's two of them, and two more. And then, continuing, there are also uh, more to come from them. And similarly, Myriad is a publisher, a very interesting one, um, because they have graphic novels that are more pol um, political and social, um, run by um, Corinne Perlman, who's a cartoonist herself. And their books include uh, a book on breastfeeding, a graphic novel guide to breastfeeding, and why not, and why not. And also, this new book coming out this year called Billy, Me, and You, by Nicola Streeton, which is an amazing story of, uh, of Nicola, Nicola's own loss of her child. Her, ch uh, her young son, Billy, died aged one. Uh, I, can't, I can't imagine what that would be like, but she's put it through, uh, 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 conveyed it through a very powerful new graphic novel dealing with the grief of losing a child. We have, of course, the mainstream, the stuff that most people know, most people think of when we say British comics, they think of American. Um, but uh, fortunately, you know, they think of people writing Superman or drawing Superman or whatever. And it is amazing how many British people are working for the almighty dollar. But the truth is that there's a lot more to British comics than just working for the transatlantic superhero field. Even though the Brits, we, the British talent, does it extremely well, of course. But homegrown talent in 2000 AD is important. Um, Brian, you've done some work for 2000 on, on Nemesis. And I think, Warren, maybe to bring you in here, you've, got, you've had some stuff recently and maybe some new things for 2018. Do you want to tell us a bit about those? Um, a series called Dandridge. Uh, Dandridge, sounds like Dandro. <laughs> yeah, Dandro's called the new, uh, new series called Dandro by Toast. Uh, yeah, um, and a few kind of like short 
But it still is, 2008 still is an outlet for, for you and for, for yeah, more quirky, yeah. experimental yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Because yeah, they do some very clever uh, originated material, particularly I think most recently there was a series called Sickleback, which I recommend very highly by Edgington and, and Disraeli, which was a very exciting one. And of course we do have perhaps reprinting some of the classics of British comics, they're being revived in book form. Uh, and Knockabout Comics have done some great stuff, they've published Hunt Emerson, Depresso, and Alan Moore's new magazine, Dodge and Logic, has been coming out. And this of course is now available also in Finishes as uh, League of Sword Gentlemen from Moore and O'Neill. Which is in fact a British book, it's published in the UK as well as published in America. Other publishers are, are playing it slightly safer. You've got publishers like Classical Comics who do very straight, in fact, completely text complete versions of classics. But Self Made Hero, a very exciting publisher, they've actually um, uh, allowed artists to create new manga versions of Shakespeare, which have been very successful uh, not only in the UK but in, in America as well, bringing Shakespeare to a new audience. They've also originated new graphic novels. Some of them are adaptations, like, for example, the adaptations of Sherlock Holmes in the middle just here, for example, or a new biography of Hunter S. Thompson, made entirely in the UK. And some of their new ones include a biography of um, uh, people like Peter O'Toole, Richard Burton, and other hell-raising 60s celebrities. And they have a whole range of new original fiction coming out uh, from UK and international artists in the years ahead. This is going to be amazing. This is next year's book by Glyn Dillon. Glyn Dillon's the brother of Steve Dillon, and he used to draw on Deadline, and he's doing this fantastic article for self made Hero, so that will be a book of the year. We come to know about the last Sam thanks to himself. Uh, tell us about know about Sam. Uh, how, did, how did Nobel get started? How did you and Alex Spiro begin know about? Ooh. Um, well, we started know about because we we thought that there was a, something missing in UK comics that was maybe a little bit more similar to what was going on in, uh, in, in the con on the continent or even maybe in North America. It's more of a kind of alternative sort of art school kind of comic. Um, we don't only do comics and graphic novels, we do illustrated books too. So it's kind of, it's, the, it's coming from the visual side of things um, possibly. And our books are also, very, there, there's something slightly nostalgic about them. I suppose the, the, the print quality, the way that we, that we use spot colours to print and on, on, on coated paper, they smell really nice. Some, they're quite stinky. As, as you approach the Nobel table, there's quite a waft of ink. Yeah. It's a salt seal, isn't it? Really? Yeah. In a nice way. Yeah, it's good. It's good. When, when, we, get, when we get deliveries of, of all of our books on printers, we're we're, we're quite happy for a couple of hours after we get home, just from the fumes, from the, uh, yeah. And you, I think you have quite a, a kind of eco-friendly sort of green policy when it comes to printing as well, don't you? That's yeah, quite important I mean, to you. Yeah, we try and print in Europe and in the UK. Um, the, the paper that we use is, is, is from, uh, you know, sustainably uh, maintained forests and stuff, so it's, it's actually quite hard to print on that stuff if you're printing in, in China. And also, if we did print in China, we'd, we'd have to ship the paper to China and then ship the books back. So it'd be a kind of defeat the purpose. Even though the printers in China are actually incredible, um, there are still good printers in Europe, so we try and use them. Now we should introduce some of the artists that you've uh, been particularly spotlighting. We've, we've spotlighted in the exhibition here, uh, Luke Pearson, who really has, is, is just infuriatingly young um, and extremely talented. This yeah. is what, Oh, 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 this is his new one, I completely didn't have uh, Everything We Miss, yeah. which is, I just reviewed it for the Times Literature, Literary Supplement, and it really is an outstanding graphic novel. It, it's actually, it's a graphic novella, really, it's, yeah. isn't it? It's, it's not a short, hundreds it's of pages. A, yeah. it's, it's a short book. About, uh, uh, sounds really miserable, it's about uh, a relationship in its sort of death throes. It's kind of two, two young people splitting up. But it's, it's actually surreal and funny, and um, it's, there's a kind of magic... Uh, realism, uh, realist kind of thing going on there as well. It's 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 not as depressing as it sounds. <laughs> Come and have a look at, and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. It really, is a remarkable book. I mean, how how old is Luke? He's in his twenties. He's he? disgustingly how, young. How young is he? <laughs> he's young, and he's already doing stuff that really is world class. And I think we're just seeing the beginning of an author who's going to 
he'd be in major courses at yeah, the time. Yeah, and he's he graduated from, from university from uh, uh, an illustration course uh, a year ago. So, yeah, yeah. That, that young. And this is exciting. What we're having, I think, in the UK, and I'm sure in, in Finland too, are many young artists coming to art school who've just been immersed in good comics and good illustration, good influences. They haven't got all the baggage of having grown up maybe with you know, superheroes or, or sort of the cliches, and they bring so much freshness to the, to the medium, don't they? He's, he's also, you know, a product of his generation in the sense that he's, he's mm. incredibly internet sort of oriented. He's grown up with, with all the social networking sites of being able to sample a bit of this from here and a bit of that from there, and, yeah. and obviously I didn't have that when I was his age. Yeah, but so I'm a huge yeah. variety of influences. Yeah, it's it's speaking of he's designed um, a computer game, hasn't he? The, yeah, he the has. End? Yeah, I think so. I don't know that much about that, but it, I've seen it, and it, yeah, I mean, I, when does he get a time to do this? You know, <laughs> supposed to be doing about three books for us, so... Uh, well, that's it, because you have, this is Hilda folk, but then you have a, a sequel to Hilda coming out next month, I think. Um, um, yeah, uh, Hilda is, is a character that he's actually done for, uh, for kids. But it's it's actually my favourite one of his his books, Hills Folk. It's it's one of those books that adults can read and enjoy as well. Um, it somehow seems quite Scandinavian. Yeah, well, it's yeah. about a, a little girl that, that that lives in a Scandinavian country of no name, but um, and uh, and she's involved in you know uh, get, uh, there are trolls and monsters and spirits and it's it's kind of a little bit Miyazaki a little bit um, it's Luke a little bit Moonies as well I yeah think. a little bit Moonies definitely yes, yes. and uh, uh, anyway the, the new book uh, Hilda and the Midnight Giant will be coming out in October uh, sorry the end of October to November maybe yeah we'll see yeah. hopefully time for, for the Comica Festival yeah. yeah the other really breakthrough artist I think that is Hugely admired by Seth, if you're aware of Canadian artist Seth, and certainly by me and many others, is John McNaught, who comes from a whole other area of comics that you haven't always seen connected to another area of art that's not always connected to comics, which is printmaking. The world of printmaking that John uh, inhabits has, has really brought about some beautiful new comics in Pebble Island and Birchfield Close. Yeah, um, his work was, uh, when I saw it the first time, he'd, he'd self kind of published this uh, little comic book, but it, he'd actually done it um, using uh, hand litho, you know, stone litho printing. Um, so it's incredibly laborious to make this. He so made 25 of this book. You'd be doing all this on computer, of course, which is the absolute anti and fixes the computer. Yeah, right. completely the, the opposite. He, he, he works entirely by hand, and um, yeah, he uses the most painstaking processes. And his work is just beautiful, and it's, uh, it's kind of very poetic. Uh, wordless, almost wordless, um, uh, atmospheric comics. Um, it, it's almost like taking a little time out when you read them. They, they, they just calm, calm the nerves. It's kind it's, of, it's nice. Yeah, they are very, very um, meditative and beautiful. I would recommend Look Nought very highly. I'm going to, I'm, this, this is me, it's too much of me talking, so I have to just get on to something. I don't have time here. I want to show what else is going on very briefly because um, and I haven't got these pieces kind of called enough, sorry. But anyway, other publishers to alert you to, Black Slate Press have been going only about, I think, maybe two years or so, two or three years. They're about the same time that, that Nobrand came on the scene. Kenny Penman is the guy behind that with his partner, Isabel, and they've done some really excellent graphic novels. Uh, after that, all of the East. Paul, Paul, by the way, uh, uh, there's a new Black Slate book that I've uh, oh, yeah, we're talking about Nelson, too. Yeah, I'm not sure I've got a picture of that. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, Nelson. Yeah, he's yeah. got Luke Pearson in as well. Yeah. Sorry, he's got Luke Pearson. And Luke Pearson. Do you want to tell people about Nelson? Nelson is a project originated by Rob Davis and Woodrow Phoenix. And it's all about this kind of biography of this girl's life from birth to. 43 or 54 years old or something and the idea was to get um, different artists for each year to do a kind of um, a day in the life of that year of that year yeah so there's a really really interesting kind of like um basically they chose writer artists or creators that um, could do that kind of thing and just kind of gave them free range so it's almost like a pass it on kind of um, experiment and um, it's quite interesting really Diverse kind of range of artists, and I'm sure you've got a fancy. Have you got my? Um, 
But it's a really clever, it's a very really clever solution. Yeah. Because one of the problems, of course, with doing any kind of anthology is that you have, you know, a little mishmash of different artists, and they all do different stories and all goes off in different directions. This has been a very clever solution to having one person's life story coordinated but told from different artists. And it's yeah. also an experiment in terms of storytelling. So oh. a lot of the way that a lot of different artists and writers like handle different stories. Um, yeah, yeah, it's like it's good. And it certainly demonstrates yeah, it demonstrates a fantastic level of, of quality, you know, of the, the current generation and, and previous generations of artists. It's really a great one. So that's Nelson that's coming out in November. Nothing to do with Kiss Me Hardy and Waterloo. It's just it's a bit, actually. Is it? Oh, is it? Is that, no, no, no. I didn't think it was. There's, there's a link. Uh, I want to point out, as we're wrapping up, another artist that we've spotlighted in the exhibition is Daryl Cunningham, who has been a breakout success in America as well as in the UK with Psychiatric Tales, which are Stories based on his experiences as a psychiatric nurse, um, often quite harrowing, what he's had to deal with in terms of people suffering, self-harming, suicide, etc. But tremendously powerful and effective comics, and he's one of the artists who's really flowered in the last year or so. Um, there's a whole range of it, also self-publishing and, and in small presses, I'm showing a few of them there. And this is a book that we're very <laughs> keen to push, which is, yeah. of course, Warren's uh, new collection of, book, of uh, stories called The Great Unwashed, which is going to be out in time for the Comic Festival, and we'll be uh, launching there. Um, and other publishers that are doing their own thing, Al Davison, Metafrog, which brings up Glasgow. Let's bring, just wrap, wrap up and bring David in here. Tell us about the Glasgow scene, because I'm, I'm showing Metafrog, John and Sandra, a couple who've made a great success with their character, Louis. Do you, do you know those guys? Do you know John and Sandra a bit? Um, yeah, because there's, there's a kind of Glasgow yeah. scene, isn't there? Yeah, well, it was a very, very small Glasgow scene, yeah. yeah. It was enough to have a convention. Yeah, yeah, convention. yeah, yeah. well, it was a small convention, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's got a nice comic scene. There's a, a comic studio at uh, the centre of Glasgow. Just oh, this is the one that, that with Frank Clyfe that you were telling me about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. they have, like, every Wednesday night, they have, like, a little gathering. Oh. Okay. Um, there's a nice little, there's a new comic shop called Plan B Books. Plan B, yes. It has a really nice selection of books. So yeah, it's got a small scene, um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of interesting artists there. Mm -hmm. and you, you, so you went to the Glasgow School of Art, didn't you? Yeah. And it, because that's quite an important place for comics to develop from. You have, and I know Mark Baines is a, a tutor there and he's been very yeah, encouraging. Um, yeah, I think since uh, I guess since Mark started teaching at the art school, which was yeah. actually kind of after I left there, um, I think making comics has been encouraged a little bit more. Um, so yeah, there is a, there's quite a few small anthologies and yeah. things. I think I guess the thing with um, Scotland is similar to the rest of Britain, where like you have a lot of big name artists it's like Frank Quietly and Grant Morrison, but they work for men from publishers. So yeah. I mean, other than you know, DC Thompson, who's it's quite doing the beating down and stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yes, yes, or Commando, I guess. Yes. Publishing comics in Scotland, so yeah, to get them, get them, I guess the opportunities are limited, aren't they? A bit. Yeah. But I mean, there's like there's a thing in Glasgow. You have like there's a nice print studio where you can make work that and it's quite it's kind of reasonably priced. And there are kind of resources that can be used there. And I mean, I might mention just also at the end here that, that this is uh, another anthology called Solipsistic Pop, which has been, I think it's got its fourth volume coming out uh, during the Comic Festival. And uh, it's put together by Tom Humberstone. It's a really very well produced, you know, high production values, done with completely a lot of care and eco awareness as well. And just great, great content, really great UK artists being spotlighted, including this cover is done by Luke Pearson again. So that's encouraging. And there are other new ones starting up. There's one called Ink. Plus paper, which is going to be coming out uh, for Comico as well, being launched. Um, and there are also as a, as a, a newspaper coming out called the Comics Reader, Comics with an X, which for one pound you get like 48 pages of full colour comics, a bit like Kuti Kuti, I guess, except it's a pound, but still it's a, a great new venue for, for comic artists to, to be presented in. Um, okay. I think it's important to pick up on uh, a plan B you mentioned. Yeah. 
which it just opened this year. Right, it, it it Britain also. has no, I think that's the fifth one, but we know of at least five graphic novel stores. Right. Not quite They specialise in selling graphic novels, and that's all they're selling. Yeah. Page 45 was the first, and it's, it's been going 17, 18 years oh, now. Yeah. And it makes, at a time when a lot of comic stores who sell the, 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 the monthly pamphlets yes. are going out of business and, and not making money, the page 45's takings go up every year. I mean, they're very successful. And they, they specialise in their ideas. They sell comics to the general public, not to comic fans. So, and it works. They have a high street store, and, every, and they still sell the stuff that the comic fans are going to buy because that's the, that's the clever part about it. You don't have to sell to them because they're going to go in there anyway and buy the comics. Um, so they specialise in graphic novels to the general public. Yeah, that's very true. And it's the same thing with I mean, the, the, one of the best comic shops as well as Page 45 and Plan B's in London, of course, is Gosh. Hopefully some of you have heard of Gosh, it's a wonderful shop. They used to be, they've been there all their lives, at, at, uh, opposite the British Museum, but they've now moved to new premises in Soho, uh, at 1 Berwick Street, which are about twice the size of what they had before. Fabulous, fully glass-fronted windows so you can see all the books spaced out, looking great. Space downstairs, they put all the superhero stuff downstairs, because they know that <laughs> they can get it the fans to let me up, and those people will find what they want. But they're getting more people than ever coming into the shop, seeing comics, seeing the full range of comics like we have here for one or two days. But they're there every day in the, the most perfect setting. A lovely, lovely, inviting, elegant comic shop with places to sit down and just read the stuff there. And it's just been amazing. I mean, uh, I was talking to the shop manager who said it's it's a whole audience that we, is, we haven't been able to reach before. And this, is what it's, this is really what it's all about. We know, I always think, my viewpoint is always that there are however many millions of people are reading comics, there are probably more that aren't, and we have to find those people. And I think many of the people involved in here in the UK, comic scene, and all of you here on this panel are more or less doing that, reaching out to a bigger readership for comics in the future. Okay, I think we're being hovered around here by Kelly, so we know we've gone past eight. So do you ever, does anyone have any burning questions of the panelists here? Um, I'm sure they'd be very happy to answer anything. If not, I would recommend that you come meet them at their tables. We'll have it all be around in the, the international section. And I'd like to thank very much Sam Arthur, Brian Talbot, and Mary Talbot, and Warren Peace, and David Kerr. Thank you very much.